My name is Joe Gall. I'm at the Carnegie Institution in Baltimore, the Department of Embryology, and I'm going to talk today about in situ hybridization. In situ hybridization is the technique by which a labeled single stranded RNA or DNA molecule in solution is hybridized to immobilized single stranded RNA or DNA in a tissue or tissue section. And by having a tag on the uh, molecule in solution, eventually the hybrid is visible uh, in the tissue section as viewed through a microscope. Uh, this technique of in situ hybridization was first carried out successfully in my laboratory in 1968. The origin of in situ hybridization, at least as an intellectual phenomenon, uh, derives from experiments that have been carried out much earlier, uh, namely around 1950, by two investigators named Coons and Kaplan. And what Coons and Kaplan had done was to develop the technique of immunocytochemistry, uh, a technique by which a fluorescent uh, antibody was uh, made to bind to the antigen uh, immobilized in a tissue section so that one could detect the position of specific protein molecules in cells by their uh, fluorescence. And shown here is a modern uh, image. This is a uh, nuclear body from a, a salamander oocyte. Uh, here shows immunostaining with a protein, uh, with an antibody against the protein coilin. Uh, here's immunostaining with an antibody against an SM protein. Uh, this is a uh, slide which I made more recently uh, using the Coons and Kaplan technique. The point, however, is that uh, they had shown that it was possible to detect specific protein molecules in tissues. And it occurred to me that it would be wonderful if one could detect specific uh, nucleic acids uh, in tissues. Actually, I was thinking less about nucleic acids as I was thinking about genes, because I had been studying the giant chromosomes of salamanders, shown here, or the giant chromosomes of Drosophila, shown here. And in these chromosomes, uh, one can see bands uh, that uh, were pretty much uh, regarded as genes by people working with them at that time. We now know it's a little bit more complicated than that, but it seemed that we had here uh, a tissue, a chromosome, where specific genes, specific nucleic acids, it should be possible to do something comparable to the immunofluorescent uh, staining technique uh, to uh, detect specific genes in these tissues. So uh, actually, I kept this in my mind for quite a long time, and it became possible to think about doing this kind of thing in the early 1960s when investigators uh, discovered that uh, one could take uh, double-stranded DNA, denature it uh, into its single strands, and immobilize those uh, strands on a nitrocellulose, fil nitrocellulose filter. Uh, this was done by uh, a couple of investigators named Gillespie and Spiegelman. And what they showed was that having the denatured DNA on a filter, one could then hybridize radioactive RNA to it and actually determine quantitatively the amount of a particular gene sequence on the filter. So I thought I I thought, well, if they can do it on a filter, you ought to be able to do it on a slide. So I tried uh, denaturing <coughs> the DNA on uh, a slide that is in uh, cells, nuclei, that were uh, squashed out onto a slide. And I found that I could denature the DNA uh, quite adequately without damaging the tissue. But then when I tried to hybridize a radioactive RNA to it, uh, I got no signal. In this case, I was uh, looking for the radioactivity by autoradiography, that is, by covering the tissue uh, with a thin layer of photographic emulsion and uh, looking for silver grains in the emulsion caused by the radioactivity of the uh, probe. As I said, nothing happened, and I more or less gave up uh, on that uh, technique. That was in 
<clears throat> the early to mid uh, 1960s. Now, a, a break came uh, quite uh, accidentally from studies that I and others had been carried out, uh, had been carrying out on salamander oocytes and frog oocytes. And what we found uh, was that uh, in the giant oocyte nucleus, which is shown here, uh, derived from this uh, large uh, oocyte uh, here, the oocyte is the egg of the frog, inside of this uh, giant nucleus are, of course, the chromosomes. But in addition, we found that there were several hundred to a thousand nucleoli, these round bodies here shown uh, on this particular slide. Now, the interesting thing about these nucleoli that we discovered was that they contained DNA. And uh, it was uh, specifically the genes that code for ribosomal RNA that were in these nucleoli. This is a most unusual situation to have DNA outside of the chromosomes. But it was quite clear from work that had been carried out in my laboratory, as well as in the laboratory of Don Brown and of Oscar Miller, that there was extra chromosomal DNA outside uh, in these nucleoli. <clears throat> and uh, I studied the origin of that DNA. And what I found was that uh, it actually has, was synthesized at one specific time in the early uh, history of the formation of the oocyte. And one could see in these uh, early uh, cells, uh, early nuclei, that there was a cap of DNA here. And you can see the cap over here. You can see the chromosomes here. And down here, you can see the chromosomes in this nucleus. So there, in these two nuclei, you have the chromosomes, but then you have this huge cap of extra DNA, which, in fact, was the ribosomal genes that had been somehow had somehow come out of the chromosome and amplified uh, to give you this one specific sequence, a very large amount of this one specific sequence. So it occurred to me that if there was any possibility of doing in situ hybridization, uh, this was the case that would work. And so I took the radioactive ribosomal RNA and uh, hybridized it <coughs> to uh, cells of this sort. And I was uh, quite pleased to see the very first uh, experiments that we got good in C2 hybridization. Uh, here, this cell is black because of the silver grains in the photographic emulsion that have been exposed by the radioactivity of the hybridizing probe. So this is a, a case where we have hybridized radioactive RNA ribosomal RNA to the ribosomal DNA in the cell. So <clears throat> that uh, led immediately to a publication with my student, Mary Lou Pardew, who joined me with this, in this work. And um, this was the first uh, successful in situ hybridization. Now, we wanted to try it on some other tissue or uh, DNA, but there were very few uh, examples because at that time, uh, it was not possible to isolate uh, specific uh, DNA and RNA sequences. What uh, permitted us to look at another uh, situation came from studies that had been carried out uh, <clears throat> on uh, mouse DNA. And investigators had found that when mouse uh, DNA was spun in a cesium chloride gradient, it separated into two fractions, a main peak and a satellite peak. Uh, called the satellite uh, simply because it uh, had a slightly different density and separated from the uh, bulk of the DNA. We took uh, this satellite DNA, uh, made it radioactive, and we hybridized it to mouse chromosomes, uh, not knowing at all uh, whether it would hybridize, uh, whether it was even in the chromosomes for that matter. It might have been a virus or some other infecting particle. But we were very pleased to see that the mouse satellite DNA hybridized specifically uh, to one portion of each chromosome. And you can see uh, on this slide that uh, each of the chromosomes has a bit of radioactivity at the very end of the chromosome. This region of the chromosome was known as the heterochromatin and uh, had been known cytologically as a, a specific uh, region of the chromosome 
uh, for a number of years. <clears throat> this led us immediately to think that we should be able to try the same technique and get similar results uh, looking at the chromosomes of Drosophila. And the chromosomes of Drosophila were especially exciting because it was known from genetics that uh, the genes were all in uh, the so-called euchromatic regions of the chromosome, namely this region from here to here or over here, these lighter stained regions. All of the genes were located in those regions. And it was known from genetics that the heterochromatic regions, uh, like here and here, uh, were devoid of genes. So it occurred to us that uh, Drosophila must have a lot of a DNA similar to the satellite DNA of the mouse. So uh, we centrifuged that DNA in a cesium chloride gradient and then found indeed that uh, Drosophila had a lot of satellite DNA. This species of Drosophila virilis that we were working on had uh, three huge satellite peaks uh, here, here, and here, uh, in addition to the main peak of DNA shown uh, here. So <clears throat> we took this satellite DNA, we uh, made it radioactive, we hybridized it to the chromosomes, and sure enough, it hybridized, as shown on these uh, images here, to the heterochromatic regions. And this was particularly interesting, as I said, because it showed that the heterochromatic regions that we knew from genetics had no genes consisted of this uh, satellite type DNA, which our uh, later studies showed uh, consisted of very simple sequences, which were uh, incapable of uh, coding for uh, genes, or uh, were incapable of being genes and coding for proteins. So the in situ hybridization technique at this point <coughs> was limited pretty much to uh, sequences that were present in uh, large amounts in cells. Eventually, it became possible by uh, having more and more sensitive probes, and particularly uh, later techniques were worked out for uh, making fluorescent uh, probes to do in situ hybridization. So in situ hybridization, ISH or ISH became fluorescent in situ hybridization, or FISH, F-I-S-H, which is the way it's usually practiced now. And <clears throat> techniques have got, gotten more and more sensitive to the point where nowadays it's possible to detect individual single DNA and RNA molecules in tissue sections. <laughs>